Hey everyone, this is Doug Worsley, the local realtor here in Southeast Detroit. And I have with me today is Heidi Grix, and she's from the Blood Cancer Foundation of Michigan. And we just wanted to kind of talk about in, uh, her organization and bring it along as to what they have to offer for us. Um, but before we get into there, I was gonna tell you a little bit about my story. For those of you who follow me, I already know, but in 2016, I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, it was pretty hard at that time. I just had lost my brother and my mom was going through some major surgery. So I pretty much kept it to myself. It was just my wife and I that knew. And it took me a year and a half to open up to tell other people. Um, and then it wasn't even until, I think it was like closer to two years to where I actually really opened up and started telling other people because I had to go through chemo. I went through chemo in 2019 um, and we, as of today, I am still cancer free, which is a good thing. Uh, but the thing that was probably the hardest for me was that first probably two years of not telling anybody, not knowing that there was a support system out there, uh, not knowing if my, I was going to be able to walk my daughter down the aisle. <laughs> every, every time it breaks me up. Sorry about that. Uh, not knowing if I was going to be able to walk her down the aisle, not knowing if my you know, I was going to see my daughter graduate or anything like that. Uh, I went to the internet and that was probably the worst thing for me because there's so much information out there that I didn't have the true education. I just wish I would have had a support group. So last year here at Keller Williams, we actually sponsored a blood drive uh, with the Blood Foundation of uh, Blood Cancer Foundation of Michigan. Okay. <laughs> And um, that's when I realized that the support group was out there and I wish I just would have known that when I found out I was actually originally diagnosed. So with that, I have Heidi Griggs here. She's the CEO of the Blood Cancer Foundation of Michigan. Uh, so Heidi, why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, the company and how it was founded and what it's all about? Of course, but first, I'm so grateful you're okay. Oh, well, thank you. How's your family doing and how are you doing? We're doing good. Uh, I'm still going through the, I'm not going through treatments, but I still go every nine months to get checked out. Um, I five years will be this June. Yeah. Um, so they say, you know, five years is that, is that, that threshold. Once you can pass that through, you know, it's less likely to come back. Mm -hmm. uh, they did tell me though, from the very beginning that there is no cure. So it's not about um, if it'll come back, it's more or less when. You know, it may never come back, but it may come back. And you know, so as long as I stay on the, the doctor's appointments and I keep checking things out and and trying to stay on top of my health, that I should be good to go. So that's what we're hoping for. Is that scary for your family? Yeah, I think, I mean, it was, you know, I've never really been scared for myself until this hit me. Yeah. Uh, like I said, it's not necessarily the thought about dying. It's more or less the thought of not being there for my family or hurting my family, mm -hmm. you know. I uh, truly love my wife and my kids and I don't want to see them suffer, yeah. <laughs> you know, so uh, who am I to think that they're going to suffer, but you know, hopefully they you know, maybe they think of me a little bit highly of myself, but, uh, but no, I mean, that's, that's really what it's about. And, you know, someone told me a long time ago, like, uh, non hodgkins lymphoma specifically is it's like having a gun to your head mm -hmm. and you're just waiting for someone to pull the trigger because you never know when it's going to hit. Yeah. Um, but the longer I go, the easier it is to, to realize that people have gone 20, 30, 40 years with this disease and they've been able to survive. So mm -hmm. the positivity, I think the mindset is what really helped me get to this level. It, but I didn't get that mindset until I started talking to people. And so until I started opening up, yeah. you know, I was so worried about my mother, you know, finding out about it that you know, it just, it was a big burden on myself and my wife that once I started opening up and realizing how common it was and the treatments that, you know, that are out there, it, it was an easier mindset. So now I have a different mindset. I know I'm going to be here, at least I'm hoping anyway, but yeah. my mindset is telling me I'm going to be here for a long time. And for that reason, I think it's easier to heal when you have a positive attitude mm -hmm. versus a negative <clears throat> attitude. Yes. And I think that was the, that hump I had to get over. Mm -hmm. And so that first year and a half of keeping it internal and looking at the internet and looking at these statistics that, you know, that I really didn't know a lot about because there's more than, there's multiple types of different non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Yeah. Um, but I also had a, a friend that I went to school with that passed away from it mm -hmm. at the same time that I had it. So oh that just kind of like added yeah. to that burden of, 
not knowing, you know, so to, even today, I don't go to the internet for that at all. I don't want to look at it because I don't want to put myself in that, in that slump again. Yeah. Um, I put a lot of faith in my doctors. Um, and actually just from that alone, you know, there was a thing where I was going with a particular doctor. Mm -hmm. They ignored it because it was actually in 2015. Mm -hmm. Then in 2016, I was with a different doctor, a different company. They actually had me, uh, they said, well, you know, it just doesn't look right. Let's examine it. So we turned around, went through the surgery and everything, and examined it. And they, even that during that time, it says it looks great. But then it was a week later, they told me I had the cancer. Yeah. That particular foundation or company, not foundation, but company, mm -hmm. I don't want to name them out, but they are more of a, hey, let's wait and see what happens. Yeah. You know, we're not going to treat it. Let's just watch it. Mm -hmm. Two years goes by, that's when I started opening up and everyone kept on saying, you gotta get a second opinion, you gotta get a second opinion, why are you not getting treated? So then I went down to the Cleveland Cancer Clinic. Okay. Uh, they came back and said that they would have treated it since day one. Yeah. So now it's like, well, who do I believe? Right. You know, you got one doctor telling you this, one doctor telling you that. Yeah. So then I my I went got a third opinion, I went to Carmano's Cancer Center right. and I went through them. Uh, he said that, you know, basically I'm borderline, mm -hmm. but he would side with uh, the Cleveland Cancer Clinic and probably treat me. Yeah. Around that same time, so my non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is um, follicular, mm -hmm. which is less aggressive. Mm -hmm. Around that same time frame, though, uh, they because I had I think five surgeries of removing lymph nodes, trying to test them and making sure what they are. The last one I did, which was in December, just before I started to get treatment, there was a large B cell, which is more aggressive. Yes. So they were estimating I was probably like an 80, 20, 80% non-aggressive, 20% aggressive. So I would have ended up going through treatment regardless. Right. However, uh, I did end up going through Carmano's and they've been fantastic ever since I started going with them and been with them ever since. And like I said, I go every nine months to, to get checked out. So keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, we love Carmano's. We yeah. They're, they're, great. It's a great company. Yeah, and, it and you know, it's just, it's tough because you never know which doctor to believe. Right. Right. And, right. There's opinions out there and stuff like that. And really what it came down to is one of my lip nodes was only 5.6 centimeters and the threshold is six. Yeah. So that's where <laughs> that's where Cleveland came in and said, it's close enough to six, yeah. you know, but I didn't have any of the other symptoms. I wasn't losing weight. I wasn't uh, having the night, night sweats. Yeah. I wasn't, uh, I don't know, there was five different ones, but I was listed as stage four which was the, you know, the scary part. And yeah. then, uh, cause I had it throughout my whole body and wow. then I needed one more thing. And that trigger was at 5.6 and then it needed to be at six in order to, wow. to treat me. So, but again, I, I found through and I went through, I went through Carmano's and we ended up, you know, solving it or okay. at least putting it on hold for a little while. Thank goodness. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, well, the story that you're telling is not an unusual story for us to hear at the Blood Cancer Foundation of Michigan. Um, that internet search, that not wanting to talk to people, that not wanting to alarm your loved ones, you know, just kind of wanting to keep it all inside, that's very, very normal. Um, we hear that from a lot of our patients. And the reality is that, just as you said, you didn't start to feel better about your prognosis until you started to talk to people about it. Mm -hmm. um, that creates some challenge because you, on one hand, you don't want to alarm your family. You don't want to, your wife to be constantly worried about you. You don't want your daughter to be worried about you, but also you're hindering your ability to recover because you're not talking about it. So we do provide emotional support. It's one of the four pillars that we provide. And we're, we're an, somebody that you can talk to about the things that maybe you don't want to talk to your family about. Maybe you don't want to talk to your friends about. For some patients, it's, gosh, I've had this for 10 years now and people see me and they think I'm over my cancer. But the reality is, like you said, some blood cancers just don't ever go away. So there's this piece of, gosh, you should be healthy by now, you're over with that cancer. And so they're not as supportive or they don't appear to feel as supportive to you as they were when you first may have spoken with them. And so you don't necessarily want to bring it up because you feel like, oh, they're going to be like, wow, we've been going through this for so long. You know, when are you going to be well? Right. So we provide an outlet for that. And th that's a um, just kind of the basic, uh, just someone to talk to. That's the very, very first level of what we do. Um, but and, and I was going to say, I do understand that because sometimes, you know, I try to post 
about it on my Facebook. Mm -hmm. I do have a following. And sometimes when I'm making the post, it, you know, I always have to sit back and think. I'm like, yeah. I'm hoping people don't feel like I'm trying to get sympathy or something sure like that. Don't. You know, I'm so sure they don't. and then you get people, you know, it's just more or less just trying to bring awareness yeah. that, you know, there are other people going out, you know, going through the same yeah. troubles or yeah. maybe it's not even the same. Maybe it's something similar. Maybe it's a different cancer yeah. or something like that, but you can still relate to it. And so for that reason, I've been posting, you know, every Thank time, you. you know, this April will be the five years of my last treatment, That's you know, amazing. so I'll probably make a post there. And then June yeah. is when I was originally cancer free. Yeah. That's it's, awesome. You know, so, uh, it'll be five years in June and then I'll probably make another post. So yeah. you need to keep posting because it's how we spread the word. It's how we help people to understand that there are people out there who can hear us and who are willing to speak with us and who've been where we may be going. Mm -hmm. You know, you are a resource for many people, um, you know, who may have your type of blood cancer and, you know, maybe they're at the beginning and they're just trying to figure out, oh my gosh, what's my next step? I'm scared. I don't want to tell my family, you know, they're in the same situation that you were in. Right. And they are heartened by the fact that somebody is willing to talk about this publicly. So don't stop posting. It's really important. Yeah. Well, now that everyone knows, I, I, <laughs> everyone knows I'm not afraid to, you know, Got I put all my garbage out there on the, on the social media. So yeah. now that it's open, I'm able to talk about it, you Got know, it. but it was that initial fear of how's the family going to handle it, you yeah. know, and it's, it's a how lot of pressure on your me? shoulders. And yes. And I just wish I would have known about your guys' organization yeah. beforehand, but yeah. that's the reason why we're here. So just get your yeah. get the word out, yeah. get your guys' uh, name out there, and, and let your people know that there's help. And that's not just for the people, person going through it, it's also right. for the family members. Yes, exactly. Let me tell you a little bit about our, yes. our program. Uh, we have a four pillar program, mm -hmm. um, and we are driven by uh, our patients and the, and their needs. Our patients, our their families, and their needs. So we have social workers, master's level social workers, who are assigned to you at the first phone call that you or email contact that you have with us, and that person who is you know has been through their master's degree is assigned to your case until you decide to leave our service. And, and when I say you decide, I want you to recognize that you decide when you're gonna leave our service. We don't tell you, I'm sorry, you've been on our service for two years or five years or 10 years, it's time for you to go. So this social worker creates a plan with you. They, they check in with you, they, they talk with you, um, check in with your emotional support, they ask the hard questions right up front. So. How, is, how are you feeling? What is your emotional capacity like? Do you have a good support system in place? How's your mortgage? Are you up, up to date on your mortgage? How's your car payment? Do you have a high level of debt? We ask all of these really hard questions because we're trying to create a rapport with folks. We know that a small percentage of people who are diagnosed with blood cancer, no matter the type, are going to run into trouble down the line. Treatments can be as long, as short as six months, as long as five years or for many cancers like your own, the rest of your life. And so we know that when you can't go to work, you can't send your kids to school, you have a lower income, and at the same time, your out-of-pocket expenses are going up because healthcare is expensive for everybody. So we wanna find out where your needs are. If you have financial need right at the beginning, we're gonna sign you up for our financial support program where we reimburse for travel to treatment and overnight stays and, and co-pays for um, uh, prescription drugs and some over-the-counter drugs as well to kind of alleviate some of that, that financial stress that you might have. Then we're going to set up a, a basically a call plan with you, find out where your emotional state is, say, how often do you want to hear from us? How often do you want to have these emotional check-ins to make sure you're doing okay? Are you feeling really stable right now? You know, okay, I'll call you in a month. If you want to talk more often, let me know. I'll schedule you for more often. And then we reach out to the patient and we talk to them and we say, how's it going? How are you feeling? What's your support network like? So we're actually monitoring that stability emotionally, financially, and socially. I haven't, I'll talk about socially in a minute, but um, we're monitoring that over time to ensure that if there is a situation that may become unstable, we can step in, help the family make a plan to bring that stability back and maintain it throughout that treatment period. So the last thing I, I talked about was social support. 
Uh, we do offer uh, programs for our patients and their families. They're all over the state of Michigan, which is our service area. And they include outings to um, the ballpark. Um, they include plays and, and music. They include going out to dinner uh, with, your, with your spouse and you know, leaving your family at home or having your whole family go if that's what you'd like to do. We try to find opportunities to get people out because we know that the, the social pieces are the first things that drop off of the agenda when money gets tight and when people are sick. And the extra things like birthday presents, Christmas presents, and things like that, holiday parties become mm -hmm. very difficult. So we try to provide those resources for folks and step in. We have big themed parties at the holidays, and um, we have a holiday toys program where we provide about $100 in toys to children and a gift card to teenagers because we're not going to try to shop for teenagers. Um, because nobody knows what they want, really, so we let them do it themselves. Gotcha. Um, and then we have these big holiday parties where they can come and see Santa and have fun. And we have Valentine's Day parties, harvest parties, Halloween parties, lots of just fun things for folks to do. Um, and one of the things that, that, that those social pieces do is it provides them the opportunity to talk with other patients who've been where they may be heading. So somebody like yourself who is attending those events and can make friends or make acquaintances with somebody who is just starting out, they can see your success. They can see where you've been. They can ask your thoughts and your advice. How did you handle this? What did you do? I feel like this, how did you feel? It's really very therapeutic for families and patients to have that ability. Nice. Yeah. So one of those, on the, especially on the social part, but not only just that, but the program itself. I mean, mm -hmm. let's talk financially. Sure. I mean, is there a cost to be part of uh, the group or, or how do you guys get your funds to be able to do all those type of yeah. outings? Socially? Yeah, we're funded entirely by philanthropy and there is never a charge for any of our services. So that means we have to be very lean in everything that we do, which we are. And um, the financial assistance is, is dependent on available funding. Um, this year, we normally provide up to $1,000 a year in reimbursements and up to $750 a year, uh, once a year, for um, emergencies that might arise. It's our special needs fund. So that may include, you know, you're, you're in threat of being evicted from your home. Your lights have been turned off. You know, your gas is going to be shut off. You're, you need tires on your car because, and you can't get to treatment. So that fund is reserved for emergencies that pop up that threaten the course of treatment. Mm -hmm. Um, the $1,000 a year is on a reimbursement model. If you're going to treatment, you're staying overnight, you have um, uh, medications that you're picking up from the pharmacy, um, you send us those receipts and we reimburse you. Um, that's dependent on funding. Right now we are at a lower level. Our normal cap is $1,750. Right now we've suspended the special needs grant and we've reduced the cap on the reimbursement to 500. And that's because post pandemic, we have been seeing an, an incredible increase in the request for service. Our um, service increase last year was 74% uh, higher than the year before. Wow. So, yeah, so, and we had, we had budgeted for, well, we budgeted, budgeted for 243 new patients during the year. We ended up with 367. So it was a huge jump. And of those new patients, the number of patients that were seeking financial assistance also but, uh, you know, it, it, it ballooned. We went from uh, about 18% of our current patients using financial assistance at every at any given time to uh, almost 30%. So that's you know it's a 50% increase. We're we had to figure out how to get more money or at least some money into everybody's hands. So we reduced the cap. And we're spreading the money wider as we go to seek funding to meet those financial needs um, to ensure that those patients have. So, you know, just uh, I'm just thinking out loud here. <laughs> is that a reason? Is there a reason behind the, the increase? Is it the, are we getting, is it because your name is getting out more or is it something, you know, with our, with our health and our, yeah. our food or whatever that we're doing or not? I don't want to get too political, just to yeah. kind of, you know. So, um, that's a good question, and it's one that, that we ponder. I write grants, and so I, I'm always digging into data. Um, interestingly enough, 
the, the diagnosis rate for all of blood cancers are relatively stable. Leukemia is rising slowly, kind of incrementally over the last um, few decades, but it's not a huge amount. Um, and it, it is a little higher than the population increase. So, you know, there's not really a, a big thing there to, for us to be able to point to and say, well, more Which people are going to diagnose. Right. But what we saw during the pandemic, we think, is what is informing our the request for services now. So people, their lives changed. Everybody's lives mm -hmm. changed, no matter who you were. And people who had a compromised immune system had to take extra precautions. And government funds came out and supported those people. They supported a lot of people during the pandemic. And now that we're seeing those funds go away, they, those um, programs have been sundowned, and people are still in the situation where COVID is out there, they have a compromised immune system, especially if they have an ongoing disease or if they're in treatment. And so they have less money coming in because they're unable to work or they don't feel comfortable going back into an environment where their compromised immune system might be at, might be at risk. Gotcha. Okay. So there is more need among those people. And I don't know, I don't even know if I should say this. Oh. I, I don't know. You don't have to say it if you want to. You, you can just keep it to yourself. I'm gonna make a comment. I was just kind of curious yeah, about <laughs> you know the whole situation. I didn't yeah. know if it was something like you guys were doing some different type of advertising yeah. all of a sudden, or if it's just a, a little bit of everything is yeah, what it's it was. Yeah, a little bit of everything okay. and, uh, and the aftermath, we think, of the pandemic. We're really exploring that, and once we get a little bit of data behind us, few more years of data, we might be able to answer that question. Gotcha. So, out of, uh, just out of curiosity, like you said the, this has been around for how many years? 72. 72. Yeah. Well, you don't look 72, <laughs> but you are the CEO, so why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, your history, and how you became you know, the CEO? Um, well, let me, look, uh, first I'm going to tell oh. you a little bit about the history of the organization. So we were founded by a couple who had lost their daughter to leukemia in the 1950s. Um, and at that time, a diagnosis of leukemia for a child was about 95% um, deadly. The mortality rate was very high. Um, the very few treatments were available. Um, the basic treatment was they would, they would give the child blood transfusions to, and make them comfortable. And so from diagnosis to death was a relatively short period of time. So they didn't want people to have to go through that with their family alone. And so they formed this organization to basically support people during that period of time. Shortly after that, they began to fundraise to, to help try to find a cure. And they, we have grown since then. About four years ago, three or four years ago, we changed our name from the Children's Leukemia Foundation of Michigan because we were treating more than children and more than leukemia. There are almost 200 different types of blood cancer. You said yours is, uh, you talked about follicular lymphoma right. and B cell lymphoma. You know, there are uh, more than a dozen different types of lymphoma. And then the subtypes underneath that are, you know, they're just numerous. So we wanted to make sure that we were speaking more transparently about what we do and who we serve. So we changed our name from Children's Leukemia to the Blood Cancer Foundation of Michigan to incorporate all that we're doing. And I came here about nine years ago. Um, <clears throat> and I, I honestly um, came to see if I could help this organization in over a short period of time. Um, I felt like I, it was in Troy at the time. I live in Dexter. It's a little bit of a drive. I agreed to come in and, and spend some time and, and create a plan for them. And then I fell in love with the organization and just said, if you want to keep you can't me, leave. <laughs> I'm willing to stay, but we need to move the office. And so we moved the office and the rest is history. And where is your office located now? We're in Farmington Hills. Um, but since the pandemic, we're also working out of home. So we have home offices for staff in um, Grand Rapids, in um, Midland, in Lansing, and Sterling Heights. Okay. Um, so as we're hiring, we're trying to put hire people in the situation, in situ where they live. And so when we're doing our social programs, we actually have staff that can be there and, and yeah. interact with the patients. Nice, yeah. very nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with that, um, I was just gonna kind of go through here, make sure I didn't hit any, or didn't miss any of the questions that I was gonna ask you. All right. <laughs> um, so I guess the biggest thing is, is like, 
how if someone is need does need the help or whatever what is the best way for them to to get into the program or to the, to reach out to somebody yeah is it the internet is it the phone call or all of the above all of the above um so you're we have relationships with all of the major healthcare systems and most of them uh, smaller healthcare systems in the state so we visit them often to make sure that there's material there and their folks are educated so you may hear about us at your at your healthcare setting we also know that um, the majority of healthcare professionals that refer to us are social workers and many, many people who are outpatients never see a social worker when they have blood cancer. So we are trying very hard to uh, educate the public about the fact that we're here. So our phone number is 248-530-3000. We will put it on the screen. Thank so. you. Our website is uh, bloodcancerfoundationmi.org or there's a shorter version, bcfmichigan.org. And either of those will get you to uh, a site where you can you can click on patients and and uh, refer yourself. There's a simple form that you fill out, and one of our social workers will be in contact with you within a day or two. Okay. Yeah. And is that the same way that if someone wanted to donate, or what what are the ways of donating? Is it just a financial, or is there other things that so much we can donate? So much. Well. Keller Williams did a did a go red for us and, and held a blood drive. Yes. That's helpful because our patients use a lot of blood. So we are supportive of those types of, of activities. Um, we also use volunteers for a lot of our events. We also have um, fundraisers that you can volunteer for or you can become engaged in. We count on financial support. That number is the same or you can just call me directly at 734-262-9362. I'll always talk to you if you're interested in learning more about fundraising okay. and, and how you can help. Any, any way that we can help. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you think you want to add to mm. get the word out or? Well, I I want you to know how grateful I am that, that you're giving us this opportunity. This is a really terrific opportunity for us to talk about our services and help to educate the public that, again, we're here. Um, so thank you for well, that. No worries. I, like I said, I, I just, I wish it was there because, you know, like I said, the emotions that I was having and that I know that if I would have brought up or even today, my kids, I, you know, I know one particular, she's constantly worried about it yeah. and, you know, calls me all the time. Uh, the other one is more reserved and keeps it to herself. Yeah. <laughs> but I do know that it's on her mind all as well. And so I just, you know, I want to make sure that they have an avenue to go to if they need to. Yeah, send them our um, way, we're happy to you talk. You know, we're pretty much open family now that I've opened up about it. You know, I tell them to keep asking, but I know that there's sometimes there, you know, people don't want to ask or they don't want to bring it up. They feel, you know, and I'm very open about mine. I've talked to a lot of people on social media. Mm -hmm. They've called me, they have they didn't want to put it on their Facebook, so they just sent me a DM and I've talked to them about it and, you know, shared my experiences and, like I said, a lot of it is is all about you know positivity, about, yes. about making sure that you know, regardless if you're going, you know, what your prognosis is or what, where you're going to go, you still got to be positive and and understand where you're at. You know, for me, I have a thing for kids, and for me, I've told everybody, listen, you know, if I die tomorrow, I don't want to die, but if I die tomorrow, I've still lived a good life, and yeah. I can't handle seeing these young people. Yeah. You know, these kids that haven't even graduated or haven't drove a car yet or done all, haven't lived life. You know, it really, it's really touching for me to try and help them. And so that's why I'm trying to get involved with your guys' organization as well. I'm willing to help the other people as well. But I mean, for me, it's really about the kids. And, and that helps me get through what I have because I know that I've actually lived a life. But again, I don't want to die, and I just want to make sure that um, you know I'm going through my treatments as well and Good. stay on top of it. So, Good. well, that makes which two is of us. don't go, don't forget, <laughs> go to your doctor and yes. and not don't ignore things because that's uh, my my father died from cancer, my mom had cancer. Wow. Um, so you know, it's my dad. I think probably died because he waited too long. You know, he mm -hmm. just he was afraid to go to the doctors. Yeah. Waited, 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 and next thing you know, he had stage four throat cancer, and oh my gosh, you know, it was irreversible by at that yeah. point. So, um, I just, you know, go to your doctor, get checked out, check out your guys' organization. Uh, if there's anything you guys can do, donate, help, do whatever you can do. Um, I know I'm going to be helping them out. We, I tried to get into there for the Christmas thing last year, but I was a little too late. So this we get, year, we have you we're signed gonna, up already. There we go. So I'm already <laughs> signed up. 
Uh, I'm going to try and volunteer some more as well. I'll take time out of my busy schedule to set some time aside for you guys and do some volunteering. So thank you. But I appreciate you coming in and then and discussing your guys' story and the organization. And again, if there's anything I can do or if any of my followers want to you know, donate or whatever, I'm hoping that they do. And we'll have all the links on there. And I just appreciate you coming in. I hope we hear from them. And I appreciate you spending some time with me this morning. Oh, no problem. Thanks. Thank you.